This video is sponsored by Brilliant. About 2,000 years ago, Eratosthenes made a very accurate calculation for the circumference of the Earth. He had read that in Syene, Egypt, during the summer solstice at noon, vertical objects did not cast shadows, as in the sun was directly overhead, which is because that city is right by the Tropic of Cancer. But in Alexandria, he noticed on that day that vertical objects did cast shadows at roughly 7.2 degrees, which is this angle here. Now, he assumed the Earth was a sphere, and also the Sun is very far away compared to the size of the Earth, and that would mean that these Sun rays are parallel. He was then able to calculate the circumference of the Earth with very simple math, because parallel lines with a line through them mean this angle and this angle are the same. So the angle separating the two cities is 7.2 degrees. He then had someone measure the distance between the two cities, which was about 800 kilometers. So because 7.2 degrees is 2% of 360 degrees, then the 800 kilometers would be 2% of the circumference of the Earth. Thus, the circumference is roughly 40,000 kilometers. And the actual circumference of the Earth is super close to that. His actual measurements gave something closer to 39,000 kilometers, but still, quite impressive. Now, two things to note. First, this only works if the cities are on the same longitude line. Or said another way, they're directly north and south of one another. These cities are not, but they're pretty close. So that's one reason for the error along with human measurement. But second, and more importantly, this does not prove the Earth is a sphere. At least on its own, it does not prove the Earth's shape, not even slightly. If the Earth were a donut, we'd still find a difference in shadow angles between two different locations at the same time. That's just going to happen if the surface is curved. But let's say the Earth were flat. Well, if the sun is directly over one place at a certain time, where no shadows are cast, and the sun is not super far away, then also, obviously, it's going to cast a shadow on a vertical object at a different location at that same time. So Eratosthenes' observation could also tell us the Earth is flat and the sun is much closer than we think. And that's what flat earthers believe. And now we're going to see why it's wrong. We're going to use the same numbers Eratosthenes found, which anyone can find themselves at least during the next summer solstice. But we'll assume for now the Earth is flat and the Sun is close-ish. So here's Syene, which the Sun is directly overhead, casting no shadows. And here's Alexandria, 800 kilometers away, where shadows cast at an angle of 7.2 degrees from the vertical. And we can use this information to find how far the sun is in this model. If we add some lines, we see two similar triangles. So we could do a ratio, but I'm just going to use the fact that this angle is 82.8 degrees. So tangent of that equals the height of the sun over 800 kilometers plus D. But D is just the length of the shadow. This is very not to scale, but that distance might be a few feet or meters, depending on the height of the building, but still nothing compared to 800 kilometers, so we can just ignore it. Then we solve this, and we get the height of the sun is about 6,332 kilometers. For reference, the International Space Station is just over 400 kilometers away, so the sun would be about 15 times further than that in the flat Earth model. And that is a problem. Let's see why. First of all, at noon, if you're in a place where the sun is right above you, then as we found, the sun is 6,332 kilometers away from you. But how far away would it be at sunset or sunrise? Well, according to this, the sun and moon never change height. They just move in a circle. And if we stop it here, this would be sunset in Egypt, where the sunlight is about to go away, which happens when the sun is actually over South America. Okay, so if you're in Egypt on the summer solstice at noon, then the sun is this far above your head. On that same day at sunset, the sun is above maybe Brazil, which is, let's say, 10,000 kilometers away. 
Using the Pythagorean theorem, that means the sun is now 11,836 kilometers away from you. It got almost twice as far compared to noon. That means at noon, the sun should appear to be about twice as big compared to sunset or sunrise, because it's about half the distance away. But that's not what anyone observes. The sun does not change size at all throughout the day. Definitely not by that factor. Everyone on Earth sees the sun as the same size, and that can only happen if it's very far away relative to the size of the Earth. So that alone contradicts a sun that's nearby, which contradicts the flat Earth model. And if you're gonna say, well, the sun is bright, so it's hard to see its true size, well, everything I just said applies to the moon as well. The fact that the moon does not change size by nearly a factor of two throughout a single day proves it cannot be as close as this model predicts. And since I'm showing math here, the angular size of objects actually does not change in direct proportion to how close they are. It's easy to see in the 2D case, like here, the angular size of the object is 90 degrees. That's how much of the field of view is taken up. If the distance to the object is halved, well, the angular size is obviously less than 180 degrees, so it did not double in size. However, this approximation is very accurate when the object is very far away relative to its size, which is the case for the sun and moon. They only take up about half a degree in our field of view. The way I like to think about it is with arc length. A piece of the circumference of a circle is calculated simply as s equals r theta. So if we imagine the sun there, then roughly its diameter is r times that angle. If the sun gets twice as close, the size remains the same, of course. The distance is halved, so the angle has to be doubled. So, there you go. It works when objects are far away. Another thing to note is that sunsets and sunrises make no sense if the sun is doing this. Again, if you're in Egypt and it's sunset, that means the sun is about 10,000 kilometers away at its same height. So the angle you should be looking at the sun is 32.3 degrees. Should be looking up at that angle. But at sunset, the angle is zero. Why the discrepancy? There's literally no explanation I can think of. The only thing you could argue is refraction, but our atmosphere refracts objects by like half a degree. It's really not much. Definitely couldn't pull an object down 32 degrees. But the explanation for sunsets that you will see from these people is perspective. This also doesn't really make sense because perspective is like when train tracks appear to converge in the distance. That's because the viewing angle, when you're looking at the portion of train tracks close to you, is some theta. But as you look further away, that angle literally decreases. The gap takes up less of your vision, making it appear like they're converging. But when you're looking at the sun, or an object from far away, that's your angle. There's no perspective, there's no illusion here. The angle is just 32.3 degrees. I should have to tilt my head up by that amount to be looking directly at the sun when it's that far away. But you know what's not perspective? Boats disappearing. If the earth were flat as boats swam away from the shore, well, you should always be able to see them because they're in your line of sight. The only perspective here is that the boats will get smaller, obviously, but it's not going to be obstructed by the water because there's literally no water on the line connecting your eyes to the boat. So the water should never obstruct the boat. The boat would just get too small to see. If the earth were a sphere, the boat would eventually either be too small to see if the radius of the earth were extremely large, way bigger than it actually is, or it will disappear over the curve, which is what we observe. How far until the boat would disappear? Let's find out. 
What I'm about to show will tell you how far you can actually see when you look out into the ocean, how far that last bit of water you can see is from you. If you don't know this distance, it's not as far as you'd think. So here's you on Earth looking out into the ocean and you have some height H. The furthest thing you can see is where the tangent line starting at your eyes reaches the Earth. That's the last bit of Earth you can see, which is what we call the horizon. Now, we want to find this distance D from your eyes to the horizon. So we just make this triangle. This length is R, the radius of the Earth. This length is r plus your height h, thus we get r squared plus d squared equals r plus h squared. I'll foil the right side to give us this, the r squareds cancel, and the h squared is negligible since your height is so much smaller than the radius of the earth, so we can just ignore that. So we get the distance d equals the square root of 2rh. If someone is six feet tall or 183 centimeters, then by plugging in the radius of the earth, we get a distance of three miles or 4.82 kilometers. That is how far you can see when looking out into the ocean. And that's exactly what we observe with boats. They start to disappear from the bottom at roughly that distance, also in line with a curved earth. And this becomes more pronounced with taller objects. You can still see objects past the horizon because they have height, but they become obstructed more and more with distance starting from the bottom. But this brings me to my last talking point. A very common response you'll hear from flat earthers is, hey, I can see these things that I shouldn't be able to see because they're so far away. And first of all, sure, but not the bottom. That is key. But sometimes it seems like we shouldn't be able to see the object at all. Well, check this out. Let's say an object is a distance L away. The question we want to answer is, what is this drop I'll call Y? Again, super simple. First, that straight line distance through the Earth technically is roughly L when we're talking about a few miles or kilometers because the Earth is so big. Again, I am not drawing this to scale, but we will use this approximation. So now we have a triangle. This length is the radius of the Earth minus y, and this length is just r. We do the Pythagorean theorem, factor some terms, cancel out the r squareds again. For short distances, y squared is negligible, makes very little difference, so we ignore that. Then we solve for y, and we get y equals l squared over 2r. Using American units real quick, We'll assume L and R are in miles, which is going to give you very small values for Y, which would also be in miles. To fix this, I'll convert Y to inches by multiplying everything by 5,280 feet per mile, and then 12 inches per foot. This gives us almost exactly 8L squared, where L is still in miles. This is the eight inches per mile squared they always mention. It's accurate at short distances. So if something is three miles away, like the horizon, the drop is 72 inches or six feet. Just like we saw earlier, a six foot observer can see three miles out. If the distance is 10 miles away, the drop should be about 800 inches or 66.7 feet. And people will say, hey, if the drop is 66.7 feet, and let's say the object is 50 feet tall, I shouldn't be able to see it. And it's not that simple. Just look at this. Here's the Earth. You're standing on the shoreline, looking out. This is your line of sight. Now, imagine if an object is way over here, way past the horizon. Well, in order to see it, it only has to be this tall to be in your line of sight. And that height is much shorter than the, quote, drop in height that occurs due to the curvature of the Earth. So even though the drop we expect might be a lot, we can still see objects much shorter than that because math. And if you'd like to learn more math, I highly recommend checking out Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is where you learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, engineering, data analysis, programming, and AI. 
With a first principles approach, this platform helps you build an understanding from the ground up. And what I enjoy most about Brilliant is their animations and interactive exercises that help you gain a foundational understanding of even the more complex topics, not through memorization, but through critical thinking skills and problem solving to help you become a better thinker. And they have a wide range of courses, so regardless of your education level, they'll have something just for you. And you can get started right now by going to brilliant.org slash Zachstar or by clicking the link below where you can try everything free for a full 30 days. You can also scan the QR code on the screen now. And with that, going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you all in the next video.